History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno, Lecture 19, Transition to Moral Philosophy, January 26th, 1965. I shall continue with my summary of what we have gleaned about a theory of freedom, or more simply about the problem of freedom, from the discussions of the philosophy of history that we have undertaken up to now. I should like to begin by reminding you that we have defined freedom as escaping from the spell or working your way out of the spell. So if you like, you can think of it more as a tendency than as a given of whatever kind. We might also say that there is no such thing as freedom as a positive determination, that there is no such thing as freedom in a succinct form. We can say only that freedom is something that has to be created or that creates itself. The difficulties raised by Kant's doctrine of freedom are linked, as you know, to an antinomy from which it never really escapes. These difficulties arise from the fact that Kant perceived or suggested that, on the one hand, freedom is the only possible defining feature of humanity, but that, on the other hand, freedom cannot be treated as something present, as a fact. But if freedom remains merely in the realm of ideas, without any foreseeable or definable prospect of its being made real, it degenerates into something vague and insubstantial. And all the infinite labors that Kant expended on the concept of freedom arise in the final analysis from the fact that, put quite simply, this is a concept we cannot dispense with. That is to say, without this concept of freedom, we cannot conceive of a situation in which human beings can live together, can live together in peace, even though on the, one ha on the other hand, this freedom is something that cannot be found in the realm of factual reality. Kant was extremely persistent in his efforts to purify freedom as the foundation of ethics from every empirical taint, and if we wanted paradoxically to uncover its empirical factual roots, it would lead us to avoid a deficiency, namely to the experience that freedom has never yet been made a reality in the entire realm of historical and natural experience, so far as this is known to us. All the difficulties of Kant's doctrine of freedom are based on our need, on the one hand, to suspect the non-existence of this freedom, uh, to respect the non-existence of this freedom, but on the other hand, not to deny freedom, because the fact is that it is a concept we cannot dispense with. Lastly, we need to establish some sort of mediating link between this non-existence and the fact of our dependence on the concept. And we should take note that the problems raised by this need for a mediating link led Kant into antinomies and aporias that go far beyond those that are treated in the third antinomy of the critique of pure reason, and that incidentally supply the foundation of both the entire Kantian doctrine of freedom and his system of ethics. I should like to ask those of you who are not yet familiar with these matters to study closely the third antinomy of the transcendental dialectic, of the critique of pure reason, inclusive of the thesis and the antithesis, together with the notes and everything that goes with them. For the fact is that I cannot give you an account of all that here, but have to assume in what I shall have to say that you are familiar with it. A further consideration emerges from our observations in the realm of the philosophy of history, and with this we travel some considerable distance from Kant, this is that freedom is not to be understood as something purely individual. It is true enough that freedom or its absence from the personal experience of the individual, as we think of it today, appears predominantly as a characteristic of the individual, as an individual characteristic. But we need to be aware that the idea of freedom as something purely individual is itself an abstraction from the contexts in which we find ourselves as living, social individual beings. And in the absence of these contexts, freedom has no meaning at all. Freedom can only ever be defined in these contexts, or depending on circumstances, as freedom from them. We may also express it by saying that, without the freedom of the species, without the social species in general, there is no such thing as individual freedom. The concept of individual freedom remains imperfect and incomplete, as long as it remains particular, as long as and to the extent that it presupposes the unfreedom of other human beings. A definition, incidentally, that is very similar to those given repeatedly by Kant, although I have formulated it in ways that are somewhat removed from his actual words. Now you may object that even in an unfree society there are individual free human beings,
I shall leave open the question of what that freedom amounts to. When I was young, I was often very surprised to see what little use some of the very wealthy people I knew actually made of their wealth. That is to say, just how little they set out to acquire of all the things that one imagines as being available to the wealthy. And I soon realized that something very like class discipline is an integral part of individual freedom. What I mean by this is that if very rich people use their money for purposes that do not fit in with specific, very restrictive notions of what is approved of by bourgeois society, they find themselves ostracized in a way that is quite at odds with their social position in other respects. Even when people seem to be largely independent of external circumstances, their freedom, in fact, exists to an unimaginable degree only on paper. <laughs> This is even truer when you consider that in general, people who are independent materially and who of course form a relatively declining proportion of the population are actually no more than a function of their own possessions and that this in itself constitutes a significant barrier to their enjoyment of their freedom. I need only remind you of people like Rockefeller whose social character is so strongly determined by the Puritan work ethic that even when they have billions, the only benefit they seem to derive from them is that when old beggars cross their path, they give them a cent by way of a present. This, this gives us an idea of the restrictions on the freedom of even the freest in an unfree society. On the other hand, however, in an unfree society, even the exceptional freedom of individuals is essentially private in nature. By this I mean that this freedom consists essentially of acquisitions at the expense of others, in a specific kind of sovereignty in which the freedom of others is always offended against a priori, and which therefore contradicts the meaning of freedom from the outset. If we wanted to make a connection between the question of freedom and the sociological problem of the upper bourgeoisie, we might say that the so-called freedom and sovereignty of the upper bourgeoisie is always distorted by their attitude of, I think I'll have that. Members of the upper crust always have something of the attitude of people who say, well, we are not nobodies, we don't have these little anxieties, we just take action. It is this very attitude that turns these people into the agents of the social process in which they find themselves, and thus into the antithesis of their own freedom. On the other hand, it would be quite wrong, and I believe that I should add this in view of the very strange distortions that all these concept concepts are being subjected to in the East. On the other hand, then, we must add that we cannot speak of a freedom of the species or a freedom of society unless it means the freedom of individuals in that society. The, the individual is, to a certain extent, the touch, touchstone of freedom. If people point to the freedom of the totality of society as a whole, and if this simply reinforces the unfreedom of individuals, then you can be sure that even societal freedom, objective freedom, is in a bad way, and that genuine freedom has degenerated into ideology. And this, as I have tried to show you, is what has actually happened almost throughout the world. We might even say simply throughout the world. I don't understand. To the point where one finds it difficult to utter the word freedom without a pang of shame. We shall have an opportunity to explain why, and this is closely connected with what we have been saying, the idea of freedom and the concept of freedom are beginning increasingly to disappear, to disappear from our intellectual horizons. And why, furthermore, simply to speak of freedom makes us sound old-fashioned or over-professorial. We shall have to give some account of what can be done to oppose this tendency. What also emerges from what we have said about freedom is that it is a historical category par excellence. This means that we cannot formulate and define the concept of freedom once and for all, as philosophers have almost invariably done, so as to be able to confront the changing events of history with this immutable concept. The concept of freedom is itself the product of history and has altered with history. I have referred you to the simplest illustration of this, namely that in totalitarian societies, I shall not even mention a society built on slavery, the concept of freedom has, re has appeared as the privilege of a few people, but that this definition of freedom as a freedom from inner and outer coercion has had such force that it has never been possible to restrict it to a minority. What we might call the socialization of the concept of freedom has made people realize that they can significantly influence their own destinies by playing an active part in public affairs.
This would give us a completely different view of the concept of freedom, that is, of political freedom, as it concerns us most immediately. We may describe the structure of such concepts by saying that they have a core meaning that remains constant, but that at the same time it constantly changes. It is a mistake, a misconception, misconception to extract this identical core from the, very, the variety of changing meanings and to adjudge, to adjudge it to be universal and un unalterable. But it would be equally misguided if, like the historicists, one were to attempt to dissolve this identical core into a process of endless change. This is the problem of a philosophy of history, of freedom, and for that matter, of all such profoundly historical concepts. And the challenge facing such a philosophy of history must be to preserve the identity, the permanent component of such concepts throughout the changes that they undergo, and not to contrast these changes abstractly with something permanent. But by saying this, I really express nothing more than the principle that governs dialectical thinking in general. In the final analysis, we must say that we should not think of freedom as a merely abstract idea, which is what seems to be suggested by the statement that it does not yet exist. It is not a mere abstraction suspended somewhere above the heads of human beings who snatch at it without being able to jump high enough to, react, uh, to reach it. Instead, we can only speak meaningfully of freedom because there are concrete possibilities of freedom, because freedom can be achieved in reality. And in contrast to the entire dialectical tradition of Hegel and Marx, I would almost go so far as to say that actually this has always been possible, that it has been possible at every moment. I have hinted to you on a number of occasions, not now that the possibilities of freedom within a state of unfreedom are growing, that they are on the rise, and I do not want to go back on this. But I should like at least to plant a few doubts in your minds about the truth of it, particularly when we learn, if we study Marx or Hegel, that the Spartacus uprising in ancient Rome or the peasant movement in Germany in 1525, or Babeuf's conspiracy under the Directory in France, that none of that would have worked because the historical conditions were not ripe. Whether historical conditions are ever ripe enough to let something happen is always judged after the fact, with hindsight, and it is very hard to say whether given the extremely complex and often irrational structure of history, things might not have turned out differently for once, and mankind might have been able to raise itself out of the mire, I myself believe that I did once experience such a moment in my youth, when a change really seemed close. That is why I am not entirely convinced by that dialectical doctrine that I have dutifully passed on to you. I should like at least to add a question mark to the, to the tradition from which I have come, and which I have been teaching you, even though, needless to say, nothing has come, up, come of it up to now, and it is always easier for the philosophy of history to take sides with the bigger battalions than to join the weaker ones. Of course, the question is highly speculative, and it is in all likelihood not really possible for us to decide what might or might not have been possible. I should only, I should only wish to issue a general warning against automatically putting yourselves on the side of the victors, and joining in when people say what people always say, when liberation movements are defeated, namely that it happened because the conditions were not right. Hegel did indeed excoriate appeals to abstract possibility, as did Marx. But there is also such a thing as an abstract impossibility, after the fact in which people try to persuade us, on quite general grounds, that a failure to achieve something proves that it would never have worked, and this inference simply won't do on its own. So the entire thing is really concerned more with the use of these categories, then with our ability to make definite positive judgments about whether something might or might not have been possible, or at any rate, different. This means then that the concept of freedom cannot be salvaged as an imperishable internal quality of man in the manner attempted by the French existentialists, above all Jean-Paul Sartre. For that turn... For, for that turns it not only into something quite vague, but even into an illusion, as seems to me to be the case in great measure uh, in the case of Sartre himself. The concrete possibilities of making freedom a reality are to be sought, and I think this is a very important point in the way in which we define the locus of freedom, namely in the forces of production. By this I mean the state of human energies and the state of technology, which represents an extension of human energies 
that have been multiplied through the growth of material production. The growth of freedom is not to be sought in the relations of production, which is the solution preferred by superficial minds. Thus, when we say that freedom can be achieved today, here and now, or in a hundred years, this does not mean that everyone should be sent to better schools, or that everyone should have enough money with which to buy a fridge and to go to the cinema, something that can only increase their unfreedom rather than their freedom. The potential for freedom lies elsewhere. It consists in the fact that the state of the forces of production today would allow us in principle to free the world from want. Insofar as unfreedom is necessary, that is to say, insofar as unfreedom can justify its existence by pointing to society as a whole, it can do so only by pointing to want. By this I mean that it is argued that without the, the pressure brought to bear on people, they would not perform the work needed to produce the, ne the necessaries of life, or that without pressure they would not be willing and able to acquiesce in the want from which they are already suffering. In this context, all the talk about a consumer society in which a greater equality is achieved, and similar epiphenomena concerning mechanisms of distribution, seem trivial compared to the fundamental changes that have taken place. What has really changed quite centrally is that technology has developed to the point where it would be possible to satisfy human needs, so that there is no longer any need for a privation. If want could be eradicated, repression and oppression would become superfluous. This would create a situation in which a degree of freedom might be established of which we could say as philosophers that it might not be a state of perfect freedom, but that such an imperfect freedom would be a whole lot better than a perfect and radical unfreedom. If want could be banished, all the instruments of oppression could come to appear superfluous, to the point where the machinery of oppression would be unable to support or to survive in the long run. This process would ultimately extend to the unfreedom of human beings, in other words, to their so-called adaptation to their social situation. That is to say, in the absence of want, they would no longer need to conform. On the other hand, however, the interests of those who profit from repression would be so threatened by such a development that the general effect must be to reduce the prospects of any real improvement in the concrete scope for freedom. And the proposition about the growth of unfreedom within freedom has as its underlying philosophical kernel the very insight that I have been trying to convey to you. This is that the closer the kingdom of freedom comes and the greater the prospects of eliminating want and hence repression for good and all, the more radically those who are interested in the maintenance of repression will attempt to perpetuate it. This is doubtless directly connected with the factor that I have already mentioned to you, whereas the probable outcome would be that the, etern the eternal sameness of the historical process that I have attempted to explain with the aid of the concept of the spell would go into reverse at the point at which want was abolished, and I mean eradicated in all seriousness, not just on the surface, but for all mankind universally and on a global scale. I believe that, after what I have said, you will be, you will be prepared to allow that I have not attempted to follow the, philos the philosophical custom of discussing freedom as the essence of individual human beings, but that I regard it as something social. In accordance with what I have said, Unfreedom must be viewed increasingly as the function of a superfluous form of domination, whose attempts to maintain itself are therefore irrational. This leads me to something of a rehabilitation of an idea that I have subjected to severe criticism elsewhere in these lectures, namely the idealist equation of reason and freedom. Freedom is quite certainly not immediately identical with reason, as a form of thought, reason on its own to begin with. For it to become freedom, reason requires something further, something that I have elsewhere termed the additional factor, and I shall have more to say about it shortly. On the other hand, however, the persistence of unfreedom today contains in its intrinsic unreason a reference, an appeal to reason, that in a certain sense vindicates the idea, the same idea as the idea conceived by idealism, as I created rationality, or as a created rationality. In a different sense, admittedly from the vindication we find in Hegel, where the identity of freedom and reason is purchased with the renunciation of real individual freedom, so that he surrenders the very features of freedom that I have described to you as the quintessential one, namely that individual, actual human beings should themselves be free.
With this line of reasoning, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that I have, the comp- I have completed the transition from my reflections on questions of the philosophy of history to those of moral philosophy, which I now intend to begin and which will be devoted specifically to the concept of freedom. Analogously with what I did in the first part of the course in my discussion of the philosophy of history, my intention is not to plow through the entire terrain of what is meant by the problem of freedom, but here too I should like to choose a canon which will enable us to focus on these matters, or if not a canon, then a model. Those of you who are present at Bloch's lecture will have noticed that even though Bloch is strongly opposed to positivism, he nevertheless made use of the concept of a model that was in actual fact developed by the positivists. I myself did likewise some time ago, for example, in the interventions. Perhaps I may say a few words about this concept of a model at this point by way of justifying the method I propose to use. It is closely connected with my critique of system. If you believe it is not possible to provide a system based on identity philosophy, that is to say a system in which existence is deduced somehow or other from consciousness, then it is hard to resist the attractions of the idea of a model. A model involves the analysis of a specific, selective, and, if you like, restricted complex of problems, in such a way that light falls on all the aspects that cannot be treated fully if one is reluctant, as I am, to elaborate a total comprehensive system. I must say, if you will forgive me for dwelling for a moment on the objective forms of what I am attempting to think, that this idea of the model has always been present to my mind in the sense that I try to think my way deeply into specific phenomena in order that light will fall from them onto the totality, not just on what I happen to be discussing at any particular moment, but on things that simply cannot be thematized by any philosophy that is so aware of its own fragmentary nature. On the one hand, if what is at stake is a type of thought that does not follow the procedures of identity philosophy, and that defines the concepts it employs only by virtue of the constellation in which they obtain a specific value, then it follows necessarily that dialectical thinking will not just apply to the phenomenon it scrutinizes, but will also point beyond it. Just as the constellation always consists of individual phenomena, so too light can fall on individual phenomena only from the constellation. Moreover, I should like to add that the illuminating force of such models and model con- concepts is all the greater, the more intensively you immerse yourselves in the details of individual phenomena. Those of you who attend the sociology seminar that takes place immediately after these lectures will perhaps have already noticed, if you don't mind my commenting on it, that of the individual seminar papers on specific social situations that we have studied, it is always those with the greatest amount of precise detail that have proved to be the most productive for our understanding of society. In other words, it is they that have gone furthest in transcending pure singularity. This suggests that there is a kind of reciprocal interaction between the constellations on the one hand and events on the micrological plane on the other. If you look behind the scenes of what I am telling you here, it will perhaps be helpful to you to realize that it is this interaction between constellation and model that I am concerned with. You will now be eager to hear what model I intend to use as a focal point for our discussions of freedom. The model is that of free will. By this I mean in the first instance, the problem of free will in its straightforward, pre-scientific sense. That is to say, it asks whether human beings are free to make their own decisions, and more particularly, whether they are internally or externally free, or whether they are determined. Initially, at least, we can ignore external determination, because the traditional view ever since Locke has been that the internal ability or freedom of decision is supposed to be independent of external pressure. One of the tasks that will fall to me in these lectures will be to provide a critique, an imminent critique, of whether the monadological construction of the free will and every theory of free will or unfree will begins life as monadological theory, as a theory of subjectivity, whether such a theory is tenable or not. The separation of inner and outer, as you will already suspect, cannot be sustained, but I shall be obliged here, too, to present you with the concrete mediation so as to explain why such a separation is not possible. However, I should like to say right away that there is something schematic about the distinction 
since empirical science has long since shown that external pressures are continued internally. The theme that this therefore poses as a central theme of any doctrine of freedom is that of interiorization. And I should like to alert you to the fact that in the discussions that you will have to put up with, the concept of interiorization will not simply shine forth bathed in the golden sunset, which normally surrounds it in these parts. I would not wish to deny the enormous, um, what? I would not wish to deny the enormous importance of interiority without which the notice, the notion of freedom could not have been conceived. Its value can only be grasped in an age and a situation in which it is disappearing, along with a whole series of other things of equal importance for the individual and society. In his book, The Lonely Crowd, the American sociologist David Reisman described the other directed character who has succeeded the inner directed personality type in the age of, of advanced industrialism. Whereas the latter becomes capable of autonomous action on the basis of behavior patterns internalized in childhood, the other directed personality type is influenced exclusively by his competitors and the mass media. Even earlier than this, in the dialectic of enlightenment, Horkheimer and I explain the dialectic at work in the interiorization of repression and its impact on the bourgeois character. Needless to say, it is important to be aware that the concept of interiorization contains a social dimension, and that if you define interiorization as an absolute in contrast to that social dimension and use it as the basis of an idea of pure human beings as such, you will then have embarked on an, in, on an irretrievable decline into ideology.